Welcome to Trinity. My name is Martin Tremblay, and I have the privilege of serving this church as chair of the Elder Board. Myself, along with the nine other elders, want you to know how much we love our church. As we've been virtually meeting with Wayne and other key leaders through this season, we recognize that our church and the global church has never experienced a time like the one we're living in. Now, more than ever, we need to be a people of prayer. Prayer for our senior pastor and the entire team as they've had to adjust to so many things in such a short period of time. Prayer that God would use this season to strengthen and build his church in ways we could never predicted. This is a very unique season for all. For that reason, we had to postpone most of the bigger projects that we were working on so that the team could adjust and focus on our current new reality that might last a bit longer than initially expected. If you have ever financially supported the work at Trinity, we want to thank you for your support in this hard time. You're helping the church continue reaching out, out such an important time. There's a clear desire to be prudent with our finances, take care of each team member, and also continue to be the church for our church family in a totally new way. The feeling of gratefulness keeps coming to me when I think about this season in my own life. There are still so many reasons to be grateful in my family, my work, and in my church. Here at Trinity, we can especially be grateful for the work the team has been doing. I was invited in a couple meetings at the beginning of the crisis and was really encouraged by the attitude that the team has been leading with. Their passion and faith in God through it all was contagious. They're allow allowing us to be able to continue being used by God in so many different ways in people's lives in Kelowna and abroad. We are confident that our church will be a better tool for God once the storm is over. Please don't hesitate to let us know if we can do anything to help you. You can reach the elders at the email elders at trinitycolona.ca. I'm really humbled to serve as an elder with an amazing group of people that is so passionate for our church. And as we begin our service today, we would like to read a few portions of scripture over you today as an encouragement and blessing. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in spirit, binding yourself together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all. For he is over all, in all, and living through all. So let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, but encourage one another. For you are to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what a Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God. Through every storm, you'll be. Free. 
faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things, God. You do great. Our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. And hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. Conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifts it high. Oh God, you have done great things. You have done great. Stir a passion in my heart, God. Let it overflow. Let it overflow. Stir a passion in my heart, God. Let it overflow. Let it overflow. Breathe on me. Holy One, come reveal your wonder now. Open wide my eyes to see there's so much more. Jesus, you are where it all begins. Your beauty calls me deeper in. Stir a passion in my heart, God. Let it overflow. Let it overflow. Stir a passion in my heart, God. Let it overflow. on me, Holy One, come reveal your wonder now, open wide my eyes to see.
light. Let it rise, let it rise. All for Jesus. Let it rise, let it rise. Holy fire burn inside. Let it rise, let it rise. All for Jesus. Let it rise, let it rise. Holy fire burn inside. Let it rise, let it rise. It's all Rest here in his wondrous peace. Oh, the goodness, the goodness of Jesus. Satisfied, he is all that I need. May it become what may that I rest all my days in the goodness of Jesus. The goodness, the goodness 
Well, every week we gather to focus on the goodness of God, but this week we come with heavy hearts in light of the great tragedy in Nova Scotia. Many of us love the Maritimes because of its incredible sense of peace, and to see that peace broken by such a horrendous act of violence truly breaks our heart. And so we just want to say we love you, Nova Scotia, though we may not be able to understand what you're going through, our hearts are with you. And today we want to pray for you. I've prepared a prayer that we're going to pray uh, specifically for this situation. So I invite everybody who's joining us online to just raise your hand as we call it to God. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, will you graciously grant your comfort to those who have been affected by the tragedy in Nova Scotia? May your strength carry those who carry the burden of sorrow. Remember the tears of those who grieve. And in this time of physical distancing, may you help the community come together in new and powerful ways for the comfort and support of one another. And so, Nova Scotia, may the God of all comfort walk beside you in this time of grief. We pray this in the name of Christ our Lord. Hey, thanks for that prayer, Corey, and thanks to our entire team for leading us today. No matter where you were at, we hope that through the music or our prayers or entire time together, that you remember the goodness of Jesus. Hey, my name's Dave. Hey, and I'm Scott. Can I just say, I, well, we miss seeing you around here. Yeah, Your laughter, sure. smiling faces, having a cinnamon bun right here in higher ground. Oh, yeah. And the biggest thing is it usually is accompanied with a buzz of activity. Now, even though you can't be right here with us, believe it or not, that buzz continues just in a completely different way. As a matter of fact, Scott, Wayne is just over there in the oh. kitchen, and he would love to tell you about what that buzz is all about. Awesome. Spend a few moments watching the news or reading the headlines, and there's no doubt many individuals are going through an incredibly difficult season. From lost jobs, facing the challenges of being isolated to essential health workers needing to live separately from family to ensure they are being safe. But in the middle of all of this, I'm grateful for the ways God's light and hope continue to shine through you and through this place, our commercial kitchen here at Trinity. Our incredible kitchen team, they pivoted in record time. Instead of seeing the obstacles, they saw an opportunity. With great care, they align the preparation and packaging of food with the heightened hygienic standards and provincial distancing protocols. Now, each week a small team gathers in this space and starts creating simple, delicious, individually packed meals to support a vast array of people like chicken tortilla soup and cornbread muffins. So good. By Thursday, everything is ready to go. It's then a second team of staff and volunteers start distributing the food from Black Mountain to West Kelowna. Vulnerable families with immediate food needs, elementary school teachers caring for children with special needs, healthcare staff working significant hours, and local mission partners like Teen Challenge. I'm so grateful for how you're being the church in this crisis. Many of you have responded with remarkable generosity in giving your tithe. Through your generosity, we've been able to support hundreds of people who have been affected by this pandemic. And it's already making a difference. The texts, pictures, calls, and stories we are hearing from, from those who have received a meal, I wish you could read them all. But here's just one. We delivered to a mom of two kids. She's an ICU nurse who is absolutely exhausted. Plus her kids are now home learners and her husband still working. She was brought to tears when she realized she doesn't have to plan for a meal this week. 
and then was beyond thankful when we were able to pull a couple more meals out of the freezer for her to use when she needed them. It's amazing to see how God chooses to work through some pots, pans, ovens, and ingredients. Yet this really is the essence of Jesus' message. Matthew records Jesus saying this, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, that text is the very foundation of our core value. We light up the dark. We realize God has called us here to be a light. We courageously move into hopelessness, need and injustice with the redeeming power of Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful for the team here in our kitchen and for our entire church community. Every day I'm hearing stories of the ways you are being a light in our city and beyond. So today, be encouraged. Your big and small acts of kindness are truly food for the soul. So proud of our kitchen, and like Wayne said, can't wait to hear what stories are gonna come next. Actually, I've got a story, Dave. All right, shoot. Sweet. Uh, just today, I heard that one of our men's groups reached out to our mayor, and this week are doing a Zoom call to not only pray for our city, but pray for him and his leadership. It's pretty cool. That's super cool. I've got one too. Nice. Uh, this one comes from our online community, uh, Alistair, and he says this, on Sunday, March 8th, it was my first time at Trinity, and I've been attending every weekend since. Now with COVID, I've been attending online. And in that time, I've been using the app and began at the first weekend in the library with Road Trip, and it's been an amazing journey since. Pun intended. Nicely. Uh, I'm now up to defying gravity, and it's been an unreal experience and so excited for the day that we can all be together in person. Okay, that's God at work. That sure is, man. It's wicked. Okay, that's actually a pretty cool story. Now, if you've ever contributed to the work of Trinity, you're actually part of Alistair's story, the food initiative, and countless other ways your generosity is making a positive impact not only at Trinity, but in our city and beyond. For sure. If you would like to give today, just follow the links on this page or in the chat. Now, ever since Easter, we've been in a new series called Never the Same. And we've been looking at encounters that Jesus had when he rose from the grave. And in just a moment, we're going to hear from Sarah, who has a powerful message on finding hope when all seems lost. Yeah, and wherever you're watching from today, thanks for being part of the Trinity Online community. Well, last week we left the disciples in a locked room in the city of Jerusalem. And as we jump into our passage today, we'll discover that eight days later, they're still there. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? How many of us are watching from the same room we did last week? Well, in the story Scott unpacked from the Gospel of Luke, Jesus appeared to the disciples for the first time after the resurrection. He told them to wait in the city until the Holy Spirit was sent to them. So here they are, still in Jerusalem, still waiting, with no time frame for when that might happen or what it would look like. If you've got a Bible, you can open it up to John chapter 20. Open a tab on your browser or the Bible app on your phone. John chapter 20, starting at verse 24. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, 
I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound on his side. Well, first of all, in our passage last week, Jesus appeared to the disciples, but if he didn't catch it, one of them was missing, Thomas. We actually don't know where Thomas was. Was he so wrecked by Jesus' death that he'd given up on the whole thing? Was he hiding in fear? Maybe he was just an introvert who needed time to process before joining the group. We just don't know. But here in John chapter 20, we discover that sometime after Jesus' appearance, Thomas met up with the rest of the disciples again. Verse 25, they told him, we've seen the Lord. They're like, Thomas, you missed it. He was here, he showed up. Now, the original meaning of the phrase, they told him, it actually means they kept saying, or they repeated it again and again. This wasn't a quick exchange. It was a looping conversation over and over. Seriously, it feels like every day in isolation, doesn't it? You've been there where you feel like you're just having the same conversation on repeat. But Thomas, he's not convinced. He holds his ground. He says, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound on his side. Have you ever said that phrase, I won't believe it until I see it? Your brother says, I caught a massive fish. Uh Uh-huh, sure you did. I'll believe it when I see it. Or a coworker says, I'm not kidding. Uh, They got a massive tattoo. I'm gonna need to see that with my own eyes. Or your neighbor this week says, I walked right into Costco with no line. (laughs) Yeah, right. I'll believe it when I see it. But what about when it comes to your faith? I won't believe it unless. I won't believe it unless. What's that for you? Maybe it's, I won't believe that God really sees me or loves me unless this happens. Or I won't believe that God is present in my circumstances unless I see him at work in this specific way. For Thomas, after Jesus' death, it was, I won't believe Jesus is really alive unless I see it for myself. Verse 26. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time... Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. Well, before we keep going, let's lay out a timeline so that we're all clear. Uh, You might need a notebook for this one. See, it's now been 11 days since Jesus was crucified. Eight since the morning when Mary Magdalene found the tomb empty and discovered Jesus alive. And she ran to tell the disciples, but they didn't believe it. Well, that same afternoon, Jesus appeared to two of his followers on the road to Emmaus. Wayne unpacked that story on Easter weekend. And those two, they ran back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples, Jesus really is alive. And as they're in the middle of telling the story, Jesus appears in that very room. It's a story Scott shared from just last week. Jesus tells them to wait until the Holy Spirit is sent. And then, nothing. Over a week later, and they're still waiting. They're still gathered in a locked room, fearful of the Jewish leaders and not sure what exactly they should be expecting. See, I'm imagining that situation, that the tension must be growing. You've got 10 guys locked in a room. Not everyone's on the same page. They don't know how long they're gonna be there. I'm guessing that Peter might be getting a little feisty because he likes to jump into the action and all there is to do is wait. The attitudes were probably flaring and patience might have been running thin. And it doesn't say they brought a change of clothes either. I'm just saying. You might be sitting there thinking, that kind of sounds exactly like my house right now. See, we're into week seven of this and none of us imagined being here. We're working from home, kids, you're doing school online, university students, you've been studying and taking finals, we're in each other's space, and for honest, it seems like nobody brought an extra change of clothes. Don't elbow your neighbor. See, at our house, uh, it's just Andrew and me and our golden retriever, Maverick. 
And let me tell you, both of us learning to work from home full time, well, it's been well. Mm -hmm. See, every day it's like we meet in the break room, formerly known as the kitchen, and you're like, wow, you're still here. Also, I think it's unique in each home depending on the ratio of extroverts to introverts. Uh, I was saying something to Andrew just this week about how hard it would be uh, to be stuck at home with someone who just has to be go, go, go all the time. And as I'm in the middle of my sentence, I stop and I notice the way that he's looking at me and his silence and the twinkle in his eye that says everything. And then Maverick slowly getting up and leaving the room because he can pick up on the tension as I quickly realize, oh, I am that person. <laughs> so in the Stanley home, we've now moved into the outdoor projects stage of isolation, which means Andrew gets quiet introvert space in the backyard and I get raised garden beds and a deck extension. And Maverick is kind of this like neutral party because when he's with me, I feel like I have someone to talk to. And when he's with Andrew, it's chill because, well, he doesn't talk. Win-win. <laughs> so, sometimes you just have to laugh, don't you? And on other days, it's genuinely really hard. It's hard to extend grace. It's hard when patience feels like it's running out and we're not on the same page. Some days in our house are really hard. Can you relate? Where is tension rising in your life? See, maybe the tension is rising in your marriage and you're not sure that it'll make it through this season. Or your patience is wearing thin with your kids and you're frustrated and you're feeling guilty for not being more present. Or your brother and sister, they're driving you crazy and you're on each other's nerves all the time. And if you're honest, you've said some things that you regret. Or maybe you're alone and sometimes it feels like the walls are closing in. The thought of being locked down with others, even if it's hard, sounds appealing simply because it would mean that you were with people. You're battling fear anxiety, and you just feel lonely. Hey, just for the record, God shows up and does some of his best work in places of tension and darkness and uncertainty. God steps into it. Well, now what? Verse 26, eight days later, the disciples were together again with Thomas. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Jesus shows up in the middle of the locked room, in the midst of the tension and the waiting. Peace be with you. Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Peace himself has entered the room. Picture it, look around the room you're in right now. See, the front door's locked, the back door's locked, there's no other way in or out. And in the midst of our own lockdown in 2020, in your living room, in your kitchen, Jesus shows up. In the midst of your circumstances right now, peace is present. In the Old Testament, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah wrote these words. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And Jesus, the Prince of Peace, sees you. He knows your situation, knows your circumstances, is with you and loves you more than you could possibly imagine. Verse 27, then he, Jesus, said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound on my side. Don't be faithless any longer, believe. He turns right away to Thomas. He doesn't ask where he was a week ago. He doesn't shame him for having doubts. He simply turns to him and says, I'm here, look at my hands. 
And don't miss it. See, Jesus wasn't present with the disciples when Thomas told them that he wouldn't believe Jesus was alive unless he could see it for himself. So he must have been totally startled when he hears Jesus quote his very words. But that's the thing. Jesus already knows exactly what Thomas needs. And he knows exactly what you, knows exactly what you need today. Exactly what you need. Verse 28, my Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. All of a sudden, it clicks. See, Thomas gets it. Jesus really was who he said he was. He's Lord, he's the son of God, he's king of kings. And from that moment, Thomas was all in. Sometimes Thomas, he gets a bad rap. He's often known as doubting Thomas. He was a late adopter, but being told that Jesus was alive after all he had seen, it truly was unbelievable. Too good to be true. It would literally take a miracle. Thomas, he was one of the 12 disciples who had walked with and learned from and done life with Jesus, who had seen Jesus with his own eyes arrested, crucified, and laid in a tomb. Everything he had hoped for, been planning for, and believed seemed completely shattered. Jesus was dead. And yet, in the midst of the confusion and the tension in a locked room somewhere in Jerusalem, despite all of Thomas' doubts and uncertainties, the God of miracles showed up. See, we read about Thomas again in Acts chapter one, gathered with the disciples and others in that same upper room in Jerusalem, praying as the message of Jesus began to spread and the early church was born. Thomas would give his life for the sake of the gospel. Literally, you can find his grave in the country he shared the message of Jesus to in India. Tradition says that Thomas is known as the patron saint of India. And it holds that he may have been the disciple who traveled the farthest spreading the gospel from doubt into distance. Yeah, Thomas would spend the rest of his life spreading the good news of Jesus. And the turning point for him, a locked room and a God who showed up in the midst of the tension and said, I am present. Peace be with you. And when Thomas finally encounters the risen Jesus, his response was, my Lord and my God, you are who you say you are. What's your response? You're in a season of waiting. In some way or another, your world is upside down these days. It is for all of us. What doubts are you wrestling with? What's weighing heavy? What relationships are strained or becoming more and more distant? Where is anxiety building? Where do you need the God of miracles to show up in your life today? Where do you need the God of miracles to show up in your life today? Because he will. In fact, he already has. See, the greatest miracle in scripture, it isn't a miraculous healing, the parting of the Red Sea, or even a talking donkey. The greatest miracle of all time was that God would send his son Jesus to earth, that he would show us how to live a life that loves God and loves others. They would die on a cross for us and conquer death so that we might have life and have it to the full. The greatest miracle is that in the midst of our circumstances, even when it feels like we're in a locked room or a hopeless situation with no way in and no way out, that Jesus is present. He looks you in the eye and says, peace be with you. Jesus, the Prince of Peace says, I'm right here. This is a story of the grace of God chasing Thomas down. That when he missed it the first time, Jesus cycled back again. It's the 99 going after the one. He already knew what Thomas needed and he knows exactly what you need today. Grace, patience, forgiveness, 
love, perspective, hope. Verse 29, then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Maybe you're brand new to this whole faith journey. You're exploring what it means to believe in and follow God. What I love about Thomas is how authentically he wrestles with his doubts and his questions and that Jesus meets him right in the middle of it. He didn't wanna believe blindly, he wanted to believe intelligently and he needed to work it through. And so if that's you, keep asking and exploring and do it with others. Talk to someone you're watching with or reach out to one of our team in the online chat. We're so excited that you're exploring. For others of us, maybe we've been following Jesus for a while and yet we can find ourselves in a place where we know deep down in our core that God is present, but we can let our current circumstances get in the way and cloud that. But after Jesus appears to Thomas and shows him his hands and his side, he says to him, don't be faithless any longer, believe. Maybe that's for you today. An encouragement and a challenge to lean in boldly to your faith. Or maybe to say for the first time, just like Thomas, my Lord and my God, I, I believe you are who you say you are and I'm all in. And as we experience that peace, would we share it with others? Would that phrase, my Lord and my God, would it spur us to look outwards, to love our neighbor? What would it look like this week to invite peace into our relationships, our fears, our conversations, our doubts, and our questions? Just like that moment was a turning point for Thomas, would we live our lives passionately, sharing the good news of Jesus and being peacemakers because we know peace is present. Scott said last week that hope is contagious. And that is so true. I've needed to be reminded of that again this week. And peace, peace is present. There's a song I've had on repeat throughout this whole season, and it says this, let faith arise in spite of what I see, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. I choose to trust you no matter what I feel. Let faith arise. So I've been praying that in spite of what I see, no matter what I feel, that faith would arise in me, that I would be reminded that God sees me, that he already knows what I need and that the God of miracles is present in my life. And so would you listen to the words of this song and perhaps allow it to shape a prayer for you as you listen. faith arise in spite of what I see Lord I believe help my unbelief I choose to trust you no matter what I feel let faith arise let faith arise For my champion's not dead, he is alive. He already knows my every need. Surely he will come and rescue me. God of miracles come. Natural love. 
kingdom come, I lift my eyes. For the battle has been won, my God is faithful. Every single word he said is true. You cannot be shaken. My heart is breaking, but I'm not broken yet. Your love is fearless. Help me to be courageous too. God of miracles, come. We need your super natural love to break through nothing's impossible you're the god of miracles god of miracles come we need your super natural See, the truth is that the God of miracles came. His supernatural love broke through. He did the impossible. He conquered death so that we might experience his peace and life to the full. In the same way that Thomas would help the message of Jesus spread as the early church was born out of the city of Jerusalem, would we help the hope and peace of Jesus spread out across the Okanagan, across the city of Kelowna, across Canada and beyond, wherever you're watching from today? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful that every time we gather, we hear stories of ways that you are at work and alive and active in us and in our neighborhoods and through our church. God, I'm so thankful that when we open scripture as we've been just intentionally looking at these stories of Jesus appearing to his followers after the resurrection, that each time there's something new. And this week, I'm reminded that just like you were present with the disciples and to Thomas, God, that you're present in my life, in our lives. Peace be with you. And so God, would we be reminded of that? Would we soak in that? Would we invite that peace to invade our conversations and our thoughts and our interactions? And God, would that spill out into a city and a world that is in such desperate need of you? So God, thank you that peace is present. In Jesus' powerful, peaceful name we pray, amen. There is so much to learn from the story of Thomas. Thanks for unpacking it with us today, Sarah, and thank you for joining us. Yes, and no matter who you are in your experience of faith, we're always grateful that you choose to make this part of your weekend. We pray it encourages you and reminds you of who God is. And don't forget to join us every morning at 8 a.m. for The Daily. Yes, do that. And don't hesitate to reach out to us through the chat, connecting with our care team, or sending us your prayer requests. Now you might want to take a few moments right now with maybe the people that you're watching with, or if you're in the chat window to stick around for a little bit. Have a conversation 
conversation yes. about what inspired you or what challenged you today. Absolutely, great idea. And also, thank you for being here. We want you to know that we love you and we're for you and we can't wait to see you again. See you next weekend. Bye.